Okay, uh, feel free to join. You can just send me your number via the mail. Hopefully, I can uh, I can connect with you. I have another meeting coming up with the other group, so um, I think um, this is just about it for today. Is that okay with Thank you? Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye guys. Please. Yeah, Adia Fauzia, please. Um, yeah, please. okay, yeah. okay, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Is my line clear? Yes, please, you are okay, sure. So, um, this is more of an open session, so um, we'll just ask you to ask any questions. You have about application to Canadian schools. So I didn't really prepare anything per se, but um, to answer a lot of questions that most of you might might have. And, and, and to add to what Hajia Fauzia said, we have with, with us Hajia um, Fauzia Zuka and Fatih Abdul Salam. Now, the reason why we shortlisted this group is we realized that you guys had questions along the lines of, hey, even if I'm not selected, I, I just want to know how the application process goes. And some of you were like, hey, um, just, just kindly assist me in this regard. And Hajia Fauzia Ali was, um, was very generous with her time to um, assist in, 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 in this endeavor. And what you might have realized is this group is mostly uh, female sisters, um, Muslim sisters. So Hajia Fauzia will be in a position to probably give you guys, I mean, advice that might, might equally help you. She's currently here in Canada. She did her MA program. She's doing very well here. And for, um, there's also Fatih Abdul Salam Bio. She's here as well. A Muslim sister just completed her undergrad and also studying her, her, her degree here. And there's also um, Fauzia Zuka, who is currently a PhD student in Ghana, but she's also coming to Canada to do um, um, a research or two for a year. So these are, these are a group of um, sisters that you can, you can rely on to guide you with your application process and how to probably um, succeed in, in your application. And hopefully, uh, maybe this might be a bit controversial. You wouldn't rush into, into getting married. <laughs> okay, so I'm here to I mean, assist you. So as part of the um, as part of this program, she's going to shortlist. Um, what was it? Ten Adia Fauzia? Yes, um, ten students. She's going to shortlist ten students okay. from you guys and assist with the partial payment. And um, she organized the WhatsApp page. If you're not part of the WhatsApp group, please leave your number. Fatih will add you. And then, uh, yeah, we can, we can proceed from there. Please feel free to ask your questions. Okay, so let me just um, open the floor by introducing myself. Maybe if I tell you a bit about my graduate school um, life, you might have some questions along the line. So I came to Canada in 2017. Um, I came specifically to do my MA in um, political science. I majored in public policy and had a minor in international relations. So it was just a one year program. And I know a lot of people ask questions about funding. Um, Brock, of course, don't like Brock doesn't give you 100% funding. But along the way, when you come, you might have additional funding, which was my um, case. I didn't have like 100% funding. I had just about 85%. But when I came, I had additional funding that um, I was able to use to offset the rest of my fees. Um, so I completed in 2018 with this MA program. And I started another MA program at Brock University and University of Buffalo, which was in New York. 
and um, as some of you might know, Brock University is um, close to New York, kind of. We are in the Niagara region and close to one of the US borders. So the University of Buffalo is, I think, 45 minutes away from Brock University. So it was a joint program in Canadian American Studies. I started that in 2019. So we used to cross the border to um, the United States, Buffalo specifically, I think twice every week. So I had to defer when I had my baby. And I know a lot of us will relate to this, like going to school and having a baby alongside, deferring, coming back, you know, it's a whole lot of stress. I know some of us might relate to um, having babies and going to school, but um, it's not that easy, but of course, people do it, why can't you? So um, to cut the long story short, um, I completed in 2020, late part of 2020. Yeah, when all the pandemic thing began. So as of now, I'm done with my MA program in Canadian American Studies, which was a joint program between Brock University and Buffalo University. But currently the program isn't running any longer because the Americans said they don't have enough funding to continue running it. And with that, I also had um, part funding, but I think for the most part, it was um, a lot of it was actually funded. I ended up paying something, but it wasn't um, hurtful to the pocket a lot. So um, yeah, I think this will open avenue for um, questions with regards to scholarships specifically. I know a lot of us have questions with regards to scholarship, like mostly. So the floor is open. Sorry, um, Farouk, I can see your hand up. I keep talking. I'm sorry it was by mistake. I probably have to, <laughs> I mean, put it down. But again, uh, maybe Fauzia Zuka is here. She can take the next um, intro. Then uh, maybe Fatih will also take the next intro because they all, they all have scholarships. So hopefully they can help with the information as well. So um, yeah, so Fauzia, do you mind um, stepping in briefly? Then Fatih will go ahead and Adia Fauzia take over again. Hello, everyone. I'm Fauzia Mohammed um, Zuka. I had my first and second degrees and third degrees in Ghana, like I'm still on my third degree. So, and my third degree, I'm also on a scholarship, World Bank scholarship. And then I had an opportunity to also apply for a visiting scholar scholarship in Canada. So I'll be joining University of British Columbia soon. Um, basically that is what I have to say as and when the questions are coming in and then I have something to say, I will chip in one or two things. Pati? Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so um Abdul Salam Fati Bill. Um I'm a master student here in University of Manitoba. I completed um last year, that's in 2020. Um I'm pursuing um mechanical engineering. And then yeah, my brother is Farouk. So um that's what I have to say. So if you have any questions to, you can ask me. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Yeah, Adia Fauzis. It's Adia Fauzis. Adia Fauzi, I think it's your, your um, I'm just going to mute myself again. Like. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize I was on mute. Okay, so um, I think we'll now open the floor for questions with regards to the entire application process. You can start asking questions with regards to starting the application, um, your statement of purpose, emailing professors, um, your CV, and eventually, application for a visa. I know some people ask about um, application of visa, even though it's early days yet, but of course you want to know 
what to expect when you come. But I feel we should prioritize questions about the statement of purpose more and the initial application process from the time you um, think of a school to apply to the, the time you actually put in your application. So any questions? And you can put it in chats as well if you feel more comfortable with that. Okay, I can see Rahma has her hand up. Okay. Um, hi. Hi. Can... Okay. Um, my name is Rama, and actually, um, I've been trying to apply to um, schools in Canada. I have almost everything of mine ready, but my issue has to do with the scholarships. Because mostly you can apply, get admission, but when it doesn't come with a scholarship, it now makes you want to just not go ahead with it. So that's my issue. The scholarships, is it that you have different organizations or foundations that sponsor it? And if there is, can you like give us um, the organizations or it's partly or it's funded by the school that is be, mm -hmm. you apply to? Because most like that, um, some to the school, but then when you go and check, it's basically 20% or less, mm -hmm. or I don't know. Yeah, so I would really like to know about the scholarships and which foundations or if yeah. it's the school that um, will see those scholarships. Yeah, um, that's a very good question. So when it comes to scholarships, we have to keep in mind that this, um, most of the schools, not every program provides scholarships. So for instance, um, for Brock University, I know the MBA programs, like there's no way they will give you like an 80% scholarship. They can give you up to, just as you said, maybe 20%. 30-ish, but for you to get a whole chunk of the scholarship is very hard. And I think most of the time is due to the demand of such programs and the willingness of some other people to actually um, pay for the fees for these programs. So courses like MBA and business, like it's very, very expensive. So it's hard to get scholarships in that regard. But I don't know the program you're applying to, but if it's the social sciences, like political science, um, psychology, geography, and all that, um, there are, you should look at the schools you are applying to in particular, because not every school, some of them categorically state that they don't have any scholarship. So if you are not willing to pay any fees, um, you wouldn't want to consider those schools. Other times when you apply and you even get the admission and it's like 20%, just I said, just as I said earlier in my introduction, once you come, you might get some assistantships from um, the professors whose research interests might be the same as yours. So it's it actually depends. And also if you don't have a lot of funding, sometimes getting the visa becomes difficult as well because the officer wants to know that you are capable of paying the fees that you have stated in your, um, the fees that um, you need to pay, right? So they want to have some sort of assurance so that you don't in quotes come and struggle um, to pay your fees. So for um, the social sciences, I have forgotten the exact council, but there is an external council during my year group. There was one lady from Kenya. She had that scholarship and it basically sorted for everything she needed up to the point of even um, getting her flight to Canada, her additional stipend and all that. But mind you, that also comes with um, a disadvantage sort of because um, those scholarships they'll tell you to return to your home country once you are done with your school well I'm not saying um, some of us don't want to return to our home country but um, the honest truth is that most of us want to stay right so if you apply for such scholarships 
you wouldn't be able to apply for what we call the postgraduate work permit, which allows you to stay in the country for an additional year or three years. In my case, it was three years because I did two separate programs, which was a total of over two years. So I had three years postgraduate work permit. So of course, unless you are willing to um, relocate back, you can apply for those um, external scholarship and not all these external scholarships um, actually require that you return to your home country. Some also just give you like an open scholarship. And there are also other um, additional scholarships, but not for international students. Most of them focus on the Canadian students. Recently, there was an article that stated that Canadians now like to go to graduate school a lot, which wasn't the case as before. So the external scholarships they provide prioritizes the Canadian citizens, right? But you can still give it a shot. I will also look through and see if I can find the exact um, type of scholarship. Can you remind me which program you are applying to? Yeah, okay, so I had a first degree in, in accounting. So I was thinking of doing an um, accounting okay. course or BA, or if I can even um, switch to uh, media and communications. That's, those are my three major ones okay. I'm looking at. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so for Brock University, I know they have, um, okay, yeah. So Brock University has MA in business economics. I don't know if you are interested in that, but I know that there's been quite a lot of Ghanaians who have gone through that department. Some are doing their PhDs now, um, some are working now. So that is also um, one program that you might want to have a look at. So it's the Masters of Business Economics at Brock University. And if you are interested, I can also reach out to some of the students who have gone through that department to also help in terms of knowing which um, supervisors to email and all that. So yeah, as I said, like in the business field, it's it's really hard for them to give you, like from what I know, of course, I stand to be corrected if anyone knows any other schools that's, uh, that is willing to provide a huge chunk of the funding, you can feel free to also tell us which school that is. But most of the time um, for business courses or MBA, they they are reluctant in giving full and um, full funding but of course you can give it a shot once you come like the thing is once you come you definitely find a way to pay your fees like i'm not giving you a full assurance but as a student you can work up to 20 hours a week and even though if you don't pay up to um a certain, I think the, there's interest accumulated if you don't pay on time. But I mean, if you're able to work about 20 hours, even though you have to take care of yourself and all that, during the summer months, you can work more than 20 hours. So most of the people here doing those business courses, I know that's what they usually do. They work to offset part of the fees. And sometimes along the way, they have um, external funding from their professors as well. Oh, okay, thank you very much. It has been really helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And um, Fauzia and Fati, if you have anything else to add, please feel free to do so. Thank you. Okay, I can see some more. Okay. Hello, please can you hear me? Yes, I can loud and clear. Okay, please. My name is Samira. Um, I would like to know for those of us interested in graduate assistantship, like is it mandatory for us to secure um, professors first before applying, or we can apply before um, getting the professors? Okay. Yeah, good question. So it depends on the school. It depends on the specific school you are applying to. So I always make reference to Brock because I've been at Brock for like three years. So for my first and second applications, I had graduate assistantship. Well, I had teaching assistantship for the first one, 
the second I had both teaching and research assistantships and none of them were applied for. And I did not have to um, ask my supervisor for like permission whatsoever before applying to the programs. So in um, for political science, MA at Brock, you don't need to do any external um, scholarship application. Everything is in one package. I don't know if things have changed because it's been three years now. So I don't know if um, things have changed with regards to um, graduate scholarships, but from what I know, and just last year, I helped someone apply to Brock. I don't think anything has changed. You just have to apply for the program. And then if you qualify for research assistantship, you'll be given research assistantship. But for the teaching assistantship, it comes with a package. It comes with the, with the scholarship. So it's school specific. Some schools will specifically tell you you need a supervisor approval. I know um, Queen's University, for instance, their geography program, you need to have a supervisor um, agree to to look at your work or to work with you before you can even apply. So you have to first, you don't just like start applying, you look at the specifications and the requirements of the school and what is demanded from each department because every department has different funding strategies. To, and okay. to quickly add to what um, Haji Afauzi has said, um, when you're about to apply, I think um, those in the ads, mostly uh, they wouldn't require you to have a supervisor before you even apply. And I think uh, we need to distinguish these two aspects of it before application and after you are being accepted, right? So what Adia Fauzia said is the two. When you are, when you're about to apply, whether you get a scholarship or not, whether you need it, whether you need a supervisor or not. Um, the first thing you need to do is before you apply, check the application um, requirements, whether you need a supervisor before you apply. I think if you're not in the sciences or some of the arts, I think this wouldn't be a huge concern for me. Um, that's one thing you probably wanna do and that will be your own research based on, your, on the school that you would like to attend. Now, when you come in, um, there are scholarships that Adia Fauzia mentioned, that is to say the, the teaching assistantship, the research assistantship and the rest. Now, this, some, some supervisors might, might, might have, you might need some prior, prior approval before you apply to this teaching assistantship or research assistantship, others will not. Now, even within the same school, you might move from one department to another department. For instance, there is, there is grading going on. They, they would like some people to come in and assist with the grading or invigilation. These are opportunities that are there for students to quickly I mean, grab and, and go get some money. Also within the same school, there are, I don't know whether I should call them shops or, yeah, there are some shops or maybe some avenues that you can quickly work and then get some money. And there are bursaries as well. Like when you're, when you're, when you're having difficulty pay, paying your fees, bursaries are basically funds that are donated by someone, maybe some benevolent um, donate, um, donation coming in and assisting students. So these are things that you can rely on in times of need. So yeah several funding avenues and i think i mentioned it in in our earlier session um the question is don't ask whether they have graduate scholarship ask what are the funding opportunities then do the calculation by yourself hey if they are giving me 50 percent funding from this um, main source what do i expect to get from the bursary what do i expect from working 20 hours a week what do i expect um extra support from family then you then you then accumulate everything and that will be your decision um that will help you make the decision but not, not necessarily whether they have a graduate scholarship or not yeah. Um, also, thank you very much. Um, please, I have one more question or two. Sorry. So, yep. please, with the teaching assistantship, does it mean you're going to be like lecturing over there, like as a teacher? Because I know mm -hmm. for the research assistantship, it's more of research, but with the teaching assistantship, I don't really know what goes into that. So, I'd like okay. to know, like, of course, yeah. So, with the um teaching assistantships, usually they give you 
um, first year classes or second year classes. In my first program, I I taught a first year class and we just, it's just like what we call tutorials in Legon. So here they call it seminars. So it's, you are not necessarily going to teach, you are just going to guide them through what they've missed. Most of the time, like I would say for me, my first program, 90% of the time, it was the students that were doing most of the talking. And that's one, um, I, for me, I think it's a loophole in the system because some people come from Legon Tech or whichever school you are coming from without any experience of teaching. Right, and you just come in your first year, you are expected to teach new people who might even start complaining about not understanding your accent and all that. But I also thought the same thing, but when I came, I realized it wasn't the case at all. Like the students were very welcoming and they, they, they did their talking most of the time. You are only there to guide them through. So you set your questions with regards to what has been taught um, maybe the previous week or what, is, what will be taught the upcoming week. So it's just like a brainstorming session where they discuss ideas among themselves. So it's not like a huge class that you have to lecture. And for the seminar, um, they don't take a class with students more than 20 for my situation, I'm sure it's, it's the same case for most of the schools in Canada. It's a very small session with like 20 students. And then for the research assistantship, my second program, I had um, a research assistantship with one of the professors. It was, um, the well, it was a different um, program and it's called the Department of Popular Culture and Communications. So if any of you is interested in communications, there's a department at Brock called Popular Culture and Communications. So I was basically supposed to just compare communication programs across Canada. And that was the only research that I had to do. I didn't have to do any teaching or anything like that. So that's the difference. For the sciences, I'm sure you might be asked to do some experiments, um, questionnaires, like I'm, I'm not too sure what happens in the sciences, but I'm sure it will be a bit different, but all in all, you just have to do like a general research with um, the supervisor funding your um, research assistantship. So that's the difference between the two. Um, all right, thank you very much. Um, I think I'll let other people ask questions and come in later on. Of course, you're welcome. Hi, please. My name is Ilha Mohammed. Yeah, hi, I want Ilham. to um first of all, I I thank you. All. Yeah, hi, Fazia. <laughs> hi. Uh, I, want, I want to thank you all for this program. And I'm really glad meeting Ali, my seniors here <laughs> once again, like Fazia Ali, Fazia Mohammed. Like I'm so happy <laughs> to, to hear from, from you. you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, please, my question is, um, how am I going to say it? Um, you see um, every school, like they have their application admission requirements, right? And then I want to know like for the master's program, for instance, if you are going in for a master's, but you already have um, another, you have master's already, you're going in for another master's. So would they pay or your master's qualification? So you were cutting in the first time. Can you repeat the last part of the question again? Uh, Are you able uh, to hear me? You can hear me. Yeah. You were cutting in and out the last uh, part. Can you repeat it, please? Uh, I think it's... Hello, Ilham, can you hear me? But if I will, can I check if she's on mute, please?
sorry. Um, I think uh, I'm not to please take over. I was I was trying to work on uh, Ilham's audio. Okay. Uh -huh. um, okay. Good evening to you all. My name is Anatu Lambon, and I think I have a quick question. Um, with regards to the requirements, some of the schools ask for um, an SOP, statement of purpose, at the same time, a writing sample. I would like to know the difference between the statement of purpose and then the writing sample. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so um, mostly for the statement of purpose, it's not um, too long. It's like two pages and it has to be brief, but you have to talk about a lot. So you talk about your, um, your background. Maybe you started at the University of Ghana and the program you, offer, you, you studied there and also the research you did. And you can also talk about your volunteering experience and just make sure you tune it in line with what you want to study. So for instance, if you want to study a master's in social work and you have um, a volunteering experience in Ghana at an orphanage or any children's center, you can include all that. And you talk about the resources of the program or the school you are applying to and how it led you to discover this school you know just a general idea why okay. you want to apply for this program and why you are a good fit you have to let them know why you are a good fit especially so you don't just narrow it down to say what you've already like done in your undergrad but you also talk about your work experience, your volunteering experience, and your research experience. But for the, um, which was the second one you mentioned, the writing proposal. So yes. for Brock, yeah, Brock asked for both writing proposal and, and the statement of purpose. So the statement of purpose is just like two pages. Then the writing sample can be one of the 10 papers you did during your undergrad. But of course, you have to make it as, as compressed as possible because if you are using a long essay and your long essay is like 40 pages, nobody is going to sit there and read all the 40 pages. So if you have like a 10 paper, which is like six pages, you can narrow it down, make sure that you have all your introduction, the body, the conclusion, and make sure that the body has or what they are actually looking for in terms of what topic you are talking about. So you provide examples in your writing samples and all that. So the writing sample is more of your research itself. So it doesn't con contain what your life experiences um, and your, um, like the school you attended, that it shouldn't contain all that. So the writing proposal will be more of your a specific research that you did. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes, Omar, you can take over. Salma, I think you raised your hand. Is there anyone by name Salma there? yeah okay i think there is yeah yeah so if someone is not ready samira can take over then uh let's see who comes next. okay thank you very much please i would like to know um for the requirements some schools require that you um submit a bank statement think something of that so I want to know the bank statement, should it be your own personal bank statement or you can use like a family member's bank statement for that? Okay, actually this is the first time I'm hearing schools asking for bank statements. I usually know it's when you get the admission and it's the, the um, how do you call it? The visa, before you apply for the visa, 
that's when you have to include a bank statement. But if that's the case, um, I, I think you can put some a, a trusted family member's bank statement. If someone or an institution, maybe Visa or a school ask you for a bank statement, I just assume that the reason they are asking you for that is for you to prove to them that you can actually afford coming to school in Canada. So I know for, because I also attended school in the US, I know some schools do that. In fact, I just remembered some schools before they grant you, they call it the I-20. So the I-20 is like the, um, what you use to apply for the visa. So before they grant you that, they want you to provide a bank statement to that effect. Some schools do that. But in my case, um, because I wasn't primarily going to school in the US, I was just crossing the border. I don't think I provided that. But yeah, I think they, they do something like that when they want to give you the admission and they want to give you the I-20 to apply for the visa, then they require for your bank statement. But in any case, if you don't have um, ample funds in your own account to prove to them that you can afford education they you can provide if it's your uncle your parent or any other person that you trust but if if you do that if it's not your direct parent usually they expect whoever so if it's your boss at work who is giving you the bank statement they want you to attach like a letter from them proving to them that's like they agree to fund your education kind of thing but i i haven't had any canadian school actually asking for your bank statements before granting your admission i don't know if um any of my fellow hosts have an idea if that's the case yeah i'm same here i haven't heard of that but um just to add to what you said um a colleague family member can give you the statement and um attach the letter but uh, in addition to the letter, I think what we also usually do is to go get an affidavit from the uh, from the court indicating that indeed the person is willing to sponsor you. It gives you some, um, I don't know, some evidence to show that the person is willing to sponsor. So it's an affidavit. If you go to the Accra High Court, they usually um, get it done in about a day or two. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, okay, thank you very much. This um, one last question. Yeah. Um, please, I want to know if it's true that some um, universities in Canada can easily waive out the English proficiency requirement for international students. Like somebody told me that. So I want to know how mm -hmm. to do that. Oh, yeah, yeah. That is, that is, that's one of the perks of um, coming to school in Canada. Um, I know for the U.S., they ask you to write GRE, IELTS, and all that, but most schools I know in Canada don't ask for any um, English um, certificates like IELTS. The only points they will ask you for, well, that's not even for the school. If you are applying for permanent residency, that's when you need to apply for the IELTS, but that's a different conversation. So I, I don't know of any school as of yet in Canada that requires you to write IELTS or GRE or any of these language proficiency um, tests. However, some, um, some schools might ask you for the English proficiency. So I know when I was applying to Brock, I actually went to the language center to get the English proficiency um, letter and that's I paid like 15 CDs at that time and I didn't even use it it wasn't actually required so Brock doesn't require for that and most schools that I know don't require for that so I remember one of my professors was saying that they have transcript and proof from you showing that you actually went to school in an English-speaking country and of course, it doesn't make sense for them to even ask us for English. Like it's one of the things I really, really despair because we've attended school all through our lives using English as the medium of language and we still want us to prove that we can speak. What more do you want to see to show that we can speak English? So um, yeah, for Canada, I don't know of any school. I don't know if Badafaruk has any idea of 
a school in Canada that requires you to do um, the IELTS GRE or any English proficiency test. Yeah, so for I think uh, I just agree with you on the English side. That is to say, for the IELTS, you don't have to write anything. Just go get the letter from the language center. But some um, program-specific requirements, like in the case of um, the business, they might they might want all the uh, applicants to write the GRE or the GMAT, just so they gauge the math aspects of it. So if they ask for GRE, or GMAT and you're applying to a specific program like business, then I think that might be a very strong requirement and they wouldn't be in a position to waiver that. Uh -huh. Okay, that's what this is. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I think we have, um, we have, um, we have Rahma. Rahma, your hands are up. You can go ahead. Salma, if you want, still want to talk, let us know. We also have Said Fredaus. You might want to also talk after um, Rahma. Okay. Um, hi. Um, so I wanted to know, I maybe I'm going far ahead of me, but I wanted to know, after, let's say you've gotten your admission and maybe gotten your year scholarship or something like that, maybe so going ahead, is it just the visa you're supposed to apply for? And if there are more processes to approximately how much do those procedures to cost? Okay. Yeah, so after you get the admission, that's another head though to get the visa because um, Canadians, to be honest, can be very ruthless when it comes to um, providing visa to students. So you just have to make sure that you check in all what they require from you. Um, what's, I'm just trying to remember what they usually ask for. So bank statements is like a must. And also I think there's a letter you write, like a letter telling them why you want to come to Canada and your plans for return. You have to put that in the letter as well then you would have to, for the fees, um, the only fees you pay is the visa fees, which is, I think, I don't know if it has changed now, but I think it's a little above $200. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, oh. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, you did. but I want to know that if there are other costs ahead apart from that and approximately how much the entire process cost before you get to Canada? Well, aside the visa fees, nothing much. And I don't encourage people to go through this um, third party visa, um, visa men because all the information you need to apply for the visa can be sought from people who already are in the country. You can also go to the website, the CIC website, that's the Government of um, Canadian Immigration website you can find all the information you need there. But as far as costs, I think it's just the visa fee that you need. Oh, and you need to pay for um, your medicals as well. But usually they, will, um, they, they let you do the medicals when they are, like they are sure of giving you the visa. So most of the people who are denied, they don't get the, um, request for medicals. So once you get the request to do your medicals, then you know that um, the, at least you are almost there. It's very unlikely to deny the visa based on medicals, unless there's of course a very serious medical issue that they used to tell you that you cannot come to the country. But after the visa, if you are granted, you'll be asked to do the medicals and that is, um, honestly, I forgot the cost I paid, but it should be a little above $500. I don't know if any of you could remember, and Brother Farouk, I don't know if you remember how much it is for now, but it think, shouldn't be above 500 cities. Um, how's it? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, okay, so I did mine last year and it was around 700 to 800 cities. Oh, my cities. Oh. The medical. The medical? Whoa. Yeah, it was around 700 to 800 CDs, the medicals. Wow, then it has um, been increased. Hello, I did mine recently and it's above 1,000. So, really? Yes, so what did it's you do? It's less than 1,000. Yeah. Archive. 
Oh, wow. okay. I did my at International Immigration Organization. And I, it yes. was... I think it's also close to that because I needed to find out the two prizes before going ahead. So oh, okay. I don't know. I did mine in September this year. I did, oh, I did mine in July. Okay. Ju July this year too. Yeah. Sorry, I did it in August. I did the upfronts. I decided to do upfronts before they asked me for. Oh, um, okay. For it, so. Okay. And the thank visa you, fee you. is two thirty Canadian dollars. It's visa fee plus the biometrics. So. Oh, oh okay. Wow. It has been increased then. Yeah. We have Salma. If Salma wants to um. Come in. No, um, yeah, okay. Some of them, Fredo. Sorry, Fredo. Uh, that, that was a bit of a mess. Yeah. So, okay. I'm hi, everyone. Um, please, my name is Alice Salma, and um, I'm a recent graduate. However, um, I wrote a paper that I'll be publishing in um, December, first week of December. Okay. But um, when I checked the requirements of some of the schools, there's a place they say, um, if you have published a paper, you can add it. So I want to know whether um, they require you to publish the whole paper, um, I mean, to upload the whole published paper or just the abstracts. And also, can I mention it in my statement of purpose? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah, that's, that's a very good thing if you have a published paper because you are actually showing them that you are, you are almost there when it comes to like graduate school because that's what they usually want to see. And I would like to commend you for that. Of course, you can add it to your statement of purpose. Okay. And also, okay. um, I'm sure Brother Farouk will highlight more on this because he has published papers. So I don't know if it okay. would be ideal to put the entire paper there, but you can provide the link and put the link okay. in your um, statement of purpose or your writing proposal. But um, I think Brother Farouk can speak more to this. Yeah, I think um, yeah, I think this, uh, this is a very good fit. Um, I mean, congrats once again. What we can equally do here, Thank you. Uh, given that it's not it's not officially published yet, if you've already gotten the uh, I don't know whether it's a peer reviewed if, if it's been if it's been reviewed already and the only thing left is for the public um education house to publish it. I think it's okay for you to say it's, it's, it's already published, or you can just basically say that it's under review, maybe if the first round or maybe the second round. Um okay. yeah, it's very good for you to mention that. Yeah. That being said, okay. uh, yeah, I think that's just about it. I think um if you have any extra questions, please let me know. I think Said Fridos might want to also ask a question, then we'll move on to Rikaya too, because they haven't Okay, thank you very much. I think that's it. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Said Fridals. Um, my question has to do with, the first question has to do with um, the visa application. In case you are not granted the visa, are you likely to lose your admission or is there a possibility of you deferring for the following year? And if you apply for the visa the following year, would they like, say, okay, you've already applied last year, so we are not going to give you a chance. Mm -hmm. And then no. my second question, okay. No, go ahead. Okay, so my, my second question has to do with the application process. Um, I actually, initially I wanted to apply for media and communication studies, but I was thinking that because I don't have or do I have a, uh, let me say, a professional background in media and communication studies? In terms of what I studied in the university, I didn't do anything related to media. So I'm thinking, are they going to like, is there a possibility of me not getting admission if the course I'm applying for is not in line with the course I did for undergrad? Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so the first question about the visa, um, you can apply for the visa as many times, but um, the more you apply and the more you keep getting rejected, then it just reduces your chance, sort of. But that does not mean that um, they wouldn't process your application. Every application is 
looked at differently, even though they might just refer to your previous applications, but when they usually deny the visa, they provide you reasons for denial. So, and mostly the reasons for denial is generic. They just put, it's, I think it's a template that they usually give everyone, but if there's a unique case in yours, they can like put it in some way. So what I usually tell people to do when they are denied the visa is to reach out to their local MP. So when you reach out to them, so for instance, in St. Catherine's, we have our local MP, right? You email them, tell them that you applied for a school at Brock and you were denied the visa. So you want to know the exact reasons why you were denied. So the MP will now reach out to the office, the immigration office, and they will give them an exact reason you were denied the visa. I know two people who did that and they got feedback from the MP on the exact reason they were rejected. So in one situation, um, she was rejected, you know, he, he was rejected because he did not actually prove enough like family ties in his application. So when they say family ties, they want to, they want you to show that, okay, what is going to bring you back home, you know, things like that. Or they can tell you that the bank statements you provided do not have any um, letter attached to it proving that like the person is willing to sponsor you. So that's what Brother Farouk was talking about earlier about the affidavit thing. So that gives it like a solid backing that the person is actually willing to fund your education, theoretically, maybe. So I would say, um, don't, don't even, of course, it's possible that you'll be rejected the visa, but just keep, keep a positive um, faith that you just get it at the first time because it's cost a lot of money and it's time consuming. So it's not something you would like to do um, two or three times. So we all pray that inshallah we'll get it at the, at the first go. And your second question, I think you, you have to get in touch with the specific departments because some departments might say, okay, even though you don't have any undergrad experience in that field, you have a professional experience. So they might give you um, a go. So for instance, the research I did earlier in communications with my um, former professor, I know there were some students in that program who did not do communications for their undergrad, but for their MA, because people change plans, right? They just want to see in your statement of purpose that like you really want to do this because after your undergrad, you discovered that your potential was more aligned towards communication. So you just want a change. We are not static humans. We change, we, we, um, we change our decisions and all that, and they understand that. So you just have to, in that case, I would say to reach out to the department and at least get them go ahead first before putting in the application, even though it's not required for most of the um, social sciences. But in this case, you can, reach out to, usually they have a graduate program advisor for every um, department. So if you can just go to the website and get their email, you can just tell them, hey, like I want to apply for this program, but my undergrad was in this and I want to do that, you know, then they can give you the go ahead. Once they do that, then it's now up to you to put in a solid application and prove to them that this is the field that you actually want to be in. And I'll give a personal example, like my second program, it was, even though it was, so I did political science, which was social sciences. The second one was in humanities, Canadian American studies. And with that, it was more of an open social science program. So I reached out to the professor and told them that I just wanted to um, do a research comparing both countries in terms of their education reforms. Because my first program, I did health reforms. I want to study um, policy in general, and I'm interested in studying both health and education. So since my first MA was for health policy, I want to analyze the health um, education policies for both countries. 
So she actually looked at my statement of purpose first before I was granted the admission. So I would say it depends on the specific school. Just reach out to the school, tell them if they give you the go ahead, then you can apply. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. Ruka, yes. Is there Ruka there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah. Um, I'm Ruka Yatu. My question, I think, at the last part, she almost answered my question. I recently completed my MSc in finance. I already have a, a first degree and undergrad in accounting and I want to have a second degree apply in Canada in a different um, program that's either social from business to social science and I wanted to find out if it's possible because that guys all my work experience has been in the finance possible and how to put it if it's possible maybe from um, um a business background and then you want to try you want to do a second degree in any of the social sciences how can i do that if it's possible that's my question okay so um, may i ask which program you want to switch to gender studies okay so yeah if it's gender studies i think there are more open because um the, like it's not gender studies even though it's social sciences and if you have some background about um like women and gender and you would like to include it in your application then you are welcome to do so and to do so another thing just i mentioned with the previous um question that the um, lady asked you can reach out to the department and i'll say gender studies is like it's really sprouting in canada now i have a friend who did even though political science is still almost the same but she is doing a phd in gender studies now and if you look at the website of the program you want to apply to and you look at the profile some of them put the profiles of the master students there and you realize that some actually diverted from a different field to gender studies. So it's up to you to put in the application, proving to them that you are now interested in doing gender studies. And with that as well, I would say to reach out to the departments. And in reaching out, like we always talk about reaching out to the departments, reaching out to the departments. Sometimes you don't get replies from the professors. So it's always advisable to email as many professors as you can. And also okay. if you can CC the graduate program director. So every program has a graduate program director and most of your inquiries could like you could um, direct all your inquiries or most of your inquiries to them. But if it's not about looking for a supervisor, I think the graduate program directors or the graduate program advisors will be your best bet. If you don't get a okay. reply in like two weeks or so, then you can now email as many professors as you can. Or if you know someone in the school that you are interested in, you can actually let the person reach out to them on your behalf because that will be much more easier. They will physically go there and ask for you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Oh, another thing, yeah, just to chip this in, another thing is to, so for instance, if you are interested in um, gender studies in Queen's University and I'm now in St. Catharines, I'm not close to Queen's and you want me to call them, on your behalf, I can try calling them. If you are not getting them by email, you can reach out to me and I can call them from here on your behalf. Okay. Okay, thank you, Fauzia. So that works. Yes. Sister Ilham can take over. 
Yeah, yeah, please. I'm so sorry. I had issues with my internet. I mean, connection. Okay. That's yeah. Okay. Um, please. My question has to do with um, the admission requirements, um, more particularly the grade point average. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in instances where you, for instance, I have I had my first degree in economics, and then second degree in development finance, but I want to go and do another master's in economics. Okay. So. I want to know, would they give much attention to my master's degree or undergrad? In terms yeah, of so mm -hmm. I'll say they'll, they'll give, like, they'll look at both most of the programs. So for me, even though I, I did um, an AMA already before doing my second one, they still had to request for my undergrad transcripts. So they will usually ask you for both and um, both degrees they want to see the trend of your transcripts for both degrees but then again it might vary um school by school some schools might just um go with your master's instead and just leave the um undergrad um, program you did but i think most schools would like to see the trend from your first degree to your current degree before um considering you yeah, hello. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because um with regards to the um the grade point average, probably maybe the first degree I didn't really meet. I mean, it would it doesn't meet the requirements as in like the grade grade point average for the Canadian school, but the second okay. degree does. So okay. that's why I'm asking, like I'd want to know, like based on the second degree, am I likely to get an admission to the MA program? So for the likeliness, it will be at the discretion of the admission um, officers, I'm very sure. Because um, of course, if it's very competitive and they have their own set requirements, they would like to use their own set requirements before moving on to like um, an outlier in, in like their instance. So, if you already have a first degree and you did a second degree, which is in line with their, um, the one you are currently applying for, and they still require you to get a certain average for the first degree, then I'm pretty sure they will still look out for that average. Unless, of course, something changes, then they would like to just use your um, second degree to, to grant you the admission. But then again, um, it's always good to email the professors and be extra sure about that because every school has their criteria for granting admissions. And I, wanna, I wanna also add um, one point here. So I think um, the schools are most interested in your latest, um, in your latest semester or your, your latest degree. So it might be the case that in your first degree, you didn't do well, but if in your second degree, you, um, you showed some resilience and you 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 perform I mean, extremely well, I think they'll, they'll pay more emphasis on that. Um, the reason I'm saying this is in, in my case, when I applied to University of Manitoba, one thing that I realized they, they kind of mentioned, but not really, like a bit um, implicit was that um, they, they, they kind of look at your final two years in your undergrad. And if you, are, if you are showing that you are a good student, then that means the continuation will be easier for you compared to someone who started on a strong note and ended on a very poor note. So yeah, so if you have a good master's and your undergrad wasn't that great, I think this is about time. It's about time you put it in your statement of interest, show them why you had issues in your undergrad and why you had this excellent performance in your master's degree and it will, it will give you the, uh, the, the edge. Um, I think we had, we had a question from Simpson. If you don't mm -hmm. mind using the mic, please go ahead. Yeah, hello. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Salam Salam. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, please, my question has to do with one of the requirements of this um, school that I'm applying to. They asked for um, my undergraduate syllabus, courses that are related to the course, the particular course that I want to offer in my master's. And 
they requested that it should come from the school. I mean, my like my university, that's KNUST. But when I checked my department, actually as an department, the, the, the school requested that they want um, the, the course that are related to the course that I want to do, the course content, and then its outcome. But when I check on that actual page, the, what they have there is only the course content. They only describe the course. But then as to the content, it's, it's nowhere. I read through almost all the courses and it wasn't there. So I don't know, am I to add that or um, I really don't know what to do. Yeah, this is the first time I'm hearing about something like this because um, usually I know what they ask for is the certificates to be sent straight from the school to them. But I don't know about course structure and did you try um, reaching out to maybe the head of departments in KMUST for your program to see if they could help you put something in and send into the school um actually um I called the examination officer because mm -hmm. most of the lecturers were directing to him and he insisted that it's on our page and then the school that I'm applying to, they said if it's not like the university will write up something to them, but then if it's not um, the department website, I should send them a URL of the page. Oh. You see, so okay. our um, the yes. Okay, so the school you are applying for in Canada wants the URL of um, the program requirement in tech. Is that what you mean? Yes, please. Yeah, then I think you can just copy the link and send it to them directly. No? Yes, that's what they expect. But then they are saying that um, we shouldn't send, I shouldn't send the, the whole syllabus. So I should create a content kind of a cover oh. page indicating which um, courses, like I'm particular about that. Yeah, it's contributing to the course that I want to offer. But I'm saying that. The, the web page from actually um, from KNUSC only has the um, content, it doesn't have the outcome. Oh, yeah, that's that's yeah, that would be a hard one because if the departments can just create it for you, that would be very that would make things very easy for you, and they are not willing to do that. No, not as we speak on vacation, it's like no one is actually reachable. I, 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 yeah, I, awesome. let me let me suggest um this maybe i think you can talk to the sec to the secretary those um those in the department the secretaries you might want to see whether they can be of help with regards to that because they they do have the course content as well as uh, the expectations and all that so um i don't know whether I don't know whether that will be easier, but it might just be another avenue for you to explore. So yeah, Auntie, our sister Ilham has a question. Um, I will allow um, sister um, Hausa to, to finish hers, then Ilham will come in. Um, okay, so thank you very much. I think I would try your method and see how that goes. Sure. Thank sure. you. Welcome. You're welcome. There is also Hamida to start. I think there are a lot of questions um, here. I yeah, just a quick one before before Hajia Fauzia answer answers the um, rest of the questions. Um, I just want you guys to have a fair idea as to what's expected. Um, please, you know the group, so this is your group. You know the number of students here. That there are quite a lot of you. Uh, yeah, let me see whether I'm sharing the screen. Yeah, so this is the screen I'm sharing right now. So um, this is the group Ajia Fauzia is currently leading. I think we have about 60 of you or so, and she's going to select, I believe, 10 students from, from, from it. So basically what she's going to do is uh, she will look at your application package, your CP statement of interest, and see how prepared you are. If you are very prepared, then uh, she'll go ahead with the payment, but it's going to be a partial payment, as we mentioned um, earlier. And in terms of your preparation, please uh, make sure you follow the guide. Um, 
check the school, make sure you're making the right choices in terms of the school. And I will personally encourage you to apply to more than one school. In terms of the, um, in terms of the, the CV and then the statement of interest, I think those interested in getting a very good CV can explore this later that I mentioned. I will try and post the video from today's session. Hopefully you can um, go through it and have a look at it as well. And yeah, so that's basically it. This group is going to be there. Ajia Fauzia is going to be in charge of it. This is the only time I will join. The rest of the meetings will be between yourself and Ajia Fauzia and Ajia Fauzia Zuka as well and um, Fatih. And feel free to ask your question. She's going to be there to answer them. Um, just to ask Ajia Fauzia, we didn't plan for more than an hour. Are you, are you in a position to take the rest of the questions or do you mind uh, moving the meeting to next week? We can move on. Okay. So, okay. A couple more questions. So those with questions, please go ahead. There's um, Hamida to Saeed. I think this might be your first time. Go ahead. Ilham, please fill in. Feel free to come in if you have any questions, Ilham. Yeah. Okay, so my next question has to do with um, hello. Yeah, go yes. ahead. Yeah, and please, I want to know um, with the Canadian schools, I mean, like once the few ones I have gone through already, um, some of them said that um, when you are given admission, you are automatically considered for funding. Yeah. I want to know the instances where they'll give you admission without funding, because they say when you're given admission, you're automatically considered for funding. But then instances yeah. where they can give you admission, but they wouldn't give you funding, and they would, I mean, expect you to fund it yourself, or I mean, use other ways to fund your admission. Okay, yeah. So when they categorically states that. Um, when they give you admission, they grant you funding, then, then they, I think they will abide by their word. But that also does not mean that they are going to give you everything, unless, of course, they state it, that they are going to give you 100% funding. So some schools, yeah, you are very right. They will state that when they give you the admission, they will give you funding. But it's after they give you the admission that they will give you a breakdown of what your funding entails. So you are aware of what you have to pay at the end of um, maybe the term or at the end of the academic year. The schools that don't give funding at all, they hey. also say that they don't give, like they wouldn't give you any funding when they grant you admission. And some will also say they give you like 20% funding. And like sometimes they wouldn't even let you know the percentage like Brock. Brock doesn't really let you know the percentage they are giving you. So when you come then, because honestly speaking, when I got the ad um, admission, I did not know that I would have something to pay when I come. So it was a bit of a shock to me. But again, I'm sure they know that once you come, you can apply for the bursaries like what Brother Faru said and um, all these um, extra assistantships. So there is this, um, it's called a spring, spring scholarship application for the summer term. And that was like $4,000. So when we had three Ghanaians in the program at that time, and all of us got that, um, that funding and it's helped offset, I think almost everything in our fees. And we also had other scholarships. So they will tell you that they will give you the funding, but some of them won't actually let you know the exact amounts you'll be left to pay because they expect you to also do the calculation because if say in Ontario, you are paying $7,000 per term and you have um, a scholarship package of like 30,000 and you do your math and you see that three times, this is what I have to pay out of my funding. This is what I'm getting for my assistantship, and this is what I'll have left to pay. Like you are not yet here, so you wouldn't be able to actually calculate to know exactly how much you'd be left to pay. But it's always a good thing if you have um, much of the funding, because when you come, there are always different ways that you could apply for extra funding to offset the rest of the fees. Oh, okay. And again, um, the, with the visa application, please, I, I learned they have a threshold 
I mean, like for the amount of the funding that would make one qualify for the visa. I don't know how true that is. For instance, if the school gives you um, maybe 50% or 20%, as you said, then you are applying for the visa and then they have a threshold, like an, an amount that you need. But would you need bank statement or something to show that when you get there, you can, I mean, take care of yourself and then fund for the remaining um, fees? Yeah, so usually when when um, you are applying for the visa, like every visa application I think is unique. So you just have to put in the application per your situation. So for instance, if you, you are applying for the visa and you only have like 20% scholarship, of course the visa officer might want to know how you intend paying the rest of your funding. So that's when the bank statement and all that comes in. And even sometimes, even if you have like all the funding, you will still have to provide, it's always a good idea to provide a bank statement and a letter of whoever um, gives you the bank statements proving that they are willing to um, sponsor the rest of your education or whichever course that might come up. So every situation is unique. So you just have to deal with your situation. If you get an um, admission that's giving you like 80% funding, you can still include you can still include a bank statement that will show that you are willing to pay the rest of the fees. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Fozia. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. I think we do have Galazi S8. Is there anyone by name Galazi X8? Please go ahead. Salamu alaikum. Yeah, alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Sorry, the name is Mariam. Okay. Mariam. So um my question is um I have done some online courses, um course on Coursera. And I kind of put it somewhere on my um, resume. Um, I want to know, can I talk about it in my statement of purpose, whether or not it um, oh, aligns yeah. with the program I'm applying to? I'm applying for MBA or the Master of Science in Business Analytics. And I have I have done some online courses oh. with um, Goldman Sachs, um, 10,000 women in business, and I'm currently um, taking the Marquis. And I have also, um, this one is not related to business, but I don't know if I can put it there. I Because I kind of have some interest in social work. So I applied for um, social, a social work course with um, University of Michigan. And I was able to get funding and go ahead with it. And I'm done with it and have um, the certificates. I also have some certificates with um, UNICEF and all that. That's more of um, humanitarian um, courses. So can I put all these in my statements of purpose or I should just leave them in the resume like that? That's my question, please. Okay, so I'm not 100% sure um, if it will hurt to add it in your statement of purpose, but I think Bada Farouk could um, speak more to this in terms of adding extra costs. You also don't want your statement of purpose to be too long, right? But I don't know if it will be beneficial to add it to the statement of purpose. Yeah. Maybe from the courses that she mentioned, uh, I think it was it was mostly um, business related. Oh, so Hello, yeah, it was mostly yeah. business related, and uh, I think it wouldn't. God miss. bless you. Yeah. God bless you. Uh -uh. Oh, someone is not on mute. Yeah, so I think um, yeah, so back to Mariam's case, I think it wouldn't hurt. Um, I think putting it on your statement of interest, briefly mentioning um, what you've done in your quest to probably enrich yourself in this field. Um, these are very good courses, even though they are online. I think uh, it complements what you are about to study, which is an MBA program. So, um, that being said, um, yeah. 
I think I think I think you should feel free to add it. It's very beneficial. Yeah, I also just sent a message. Please um, try and um, send your numbers to Hadia Fauzia Ali or Fatih Bio so that she can add it to the WhatsApp group. I think uh, we are trying to get more direct communication line. Some of the emails that we send do end up in the spam. Um, so Hadia Fauzia's group, please send it to um, Hadia Fauzia. She will add it to the WhatsApp group. If there is any, any information to be shared, she'll let you guys know. Okay. Ajay Fauzia, please go ahead. If there are any questions, please please pick them up. Okay. Is there any other question? We can take a couple more questions. Yeah, go ahead, Amida, too. Yeah. Is Hamida too there? If there's it's if, speaking, but it's really low. Yeah, it's very, very low. Maybe Fridals might want to take over, then she will come back in later. I, yeah, I Thank you so much again. Yeah. Um, my question has to do with um accommodation. So if you get the admission and you are granted a visa, do you have to like the university? Do they have like how we have here University of Ghana? We have the various halls and things like do you have to apply for a hall over there or when you get there, the university will sort you out? Or is it like you have to find an accommodation on your own and be sure of it before going? Okay. Yeah, so um, when it comes to the accommodation, usually the school halls are more expensive than the neighboring houses that you could get. Because... Um, you could get a fairly decent, maybe three bedroom for three people at say $450 to $500, depending on the house. So when it comes to looking for the rooms, that one, it's totally up to the students. The, the school doesn't really help with that. Unless you want the school halls, which are relatively more expensive, then you could reach out to... Um, they call them their residences. You could reach out to them to um, book uh, a session to view the rooms, like a virtual session to view the rooms. But I always advise students to just, if you know someone in the school you are applying to, they could help you look for rooms or they could help you like look for houses that will be within your budget. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, um, I, mean, I think Hamida too, if you still want to use the mic, go ahead. If not, I think it's almost an hour and a half now. And some of us would like to um, go attend to other issues. So hopefully next week, Hadja Fauzia might be available to assist as well. I would just encourage, I would just encourage you guys to start with the application packages. I'll make sure they are ready. Mm -hmm. She can go ahead and um, help with the submission. If there are no questions, um, I think that should be that should be it for today. Um, the next session, I think I just have a different Zoom link, and I wouldn't be here. Uh, and then, um, yeah, that's mostly it. Hadia Fauzia, Hadia Fatih, Hadia Fauzia, Muhammad. If you guys have any last um, any last comments, please let just let us know. Yeah, I'll say thanks to everyone for making it and just keep on pushing and keep on writing the SOPs. And we all pray for a favorable outcome, inshallah. Thanks for coming. Yeah, Fauzia Muhammad Zuka. Okay, I will say that um, since they are about to start applying, I would comment on the SOPs. They, it, um, they have to be more focused and you need not exaggerate the issues in there. Sometimes some of the people want to talk about um, how deplorable Africa is just to appeal to the conscience of the admission committee and all those things. I think it's not really necessary. So you have to be focused, talk about the right issues in the SOPs and then you are good to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, Fatty, uh, do you have any last comments?
Okay. I think that should, yeah. Adia Fauzia, Fauzia Ali, you uh, might just want to yeah. with final words and see when next to meet them, yeah, based on your timeline. Yeah. Okay. I will check my schedule and see when we, we can meet again. So I'll much. communicate with you. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, please keep on working on your applications and uh, hopefully it goes through. Salaamu alaikum again. Thank you so much. Thank you.